of Jesus that make the pathway glow. Our theme this week has been walking with God, and we've talked about walking with our Lord Jesus Christ, walking in the light, not walking in darkness, walking by faith. A tremendous series of messages by different men in Faith Presbytery that help us to understand what it means to walk with God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed God come in the flesh, so as we follow in his footsteps, and as we walk in the light, we have fellowship with him, with the Father, and with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and following. The message that I have for you today is the path of life, and Enoch walked with God. We read our text just a few moments ago out of the book of Genesis, and then out of Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. Let me read that passage once more out of Genesis chapter 5. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And then Psalm 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that your word is supernatural. It is not the word of man, it is the word of God. We thank you that as we look into the scriptures we have a direct access, a window into your mind for you have explained to us that which you are. You have explained to us that which you have made us to be. You have explained to us our wretched and sinful condition. And you have explained to us the way of salvation, the path on which we should go. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How we thank you, Father, for him. 
for his substitutionary sacrifice, for his death in our place on Calvary's cross, his burial, and then the guarantee that his promises are true, the great resurrection from the dead. Father, again we pray for your word as it goes forth that you will give us hearing ears, understanding hearts, believing hearts, obedient hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the two passages of scripture that I've just read have some very interesting and, well, very unique uh, characteristics about them. The first is about a man who lived many, many years ago. The second is actually in the context of messianic prophecy. Psalm 16 is filled with messianic prophecies and they are quoted as such in the New Testament. And so you say, well, what do these two passages have in common with one another? Well, let's start first by looking at some overview understanding of Genesis chapter 5. The Genesis passage is perhaps one of the very last passages in which you would expect to find instructions about walking with God. You see, it's in the middle of a genealogy, a genealogical list. That's where our first passage is located. But that also should be a reminder to us of at least seven different things. Number one, it should remind us, as we read about Enoch walking with God and begetting Methuselah and and so-and-so begets so-and-so and so-and-so begets so-and-so, it should remind us of something very, very important. And that is that the entire Bible is inspired, including the genealogies. Yes, those great, big, huge, long lists of unpronounceable names were inspired word for word by God. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and now here's the purpose, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God had a reason for inspiring even the genealogies. And he has some things to teach us out of those genealogies because all scripture is given by inspiration of God And that brings us to point two, it's profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable correction. It's profitable for instruction. Even the genealogies are profitable for doctrine. Did you know that? We'll see some of that today. The genealogies are profitable for reproof. We'll see some of that today. The genealogies are profitable for correction. We'll see some of that today. And the genealogies are profitable for instruction in righteousness because God has through those genealogies as well as all the other parts of scripture a specific design that is to bring us to spiritual maturity and a life of service that is pleasing to God that a man of God may be perfect that is mature truly truly that's through and through it's not thoroughly it's the word truly there in English furnished unto all good works a life that is filled with works that are pleasing to God and that can be used in his service. We look in the middle of this genealogy, never expecting to find all of those things, and yet here we see it in the life of a man by the name of Enoch. There's a spiritual prophet designed by God found in the genealogical tables. Of course, some people are surprised to think that There are rich spiritual truths, things like diamonds, in what most people think are very dull, uninteresting, and very unlikely places, but they are there because God's Word tells us that they are there. Number three, that also means that the genealogical lists are a record of real history and real people. I think most of us would like to be remembered for something. Several weeks ago, as we were celebrating Memorial Day Sunday, we talked about how very, very few people are remembered. There are very few memorials, and even when you walk through the cemeteries, you don't know who those people were. You see a name, you see a date of birth, you see a date of death. Very few of them do we know anything about. Many of them, no one knows anything about. The genealogical records have been lost or destroyed during various wars here in the United States. They've been buried without markers. They are people who are forgotten. But God said that he would give his name for a memorial. It is a name that will be remembered throughout all generations. It is a name that reminds us of who he is and of what he has done. And God, in his wisdom, has chosen 
certain names of real people in real historical contexts and has engraved them in his word, which is forever settled in heaven. Even if you were only just mentioned in passing, wouldn't you love to have your name inscribed in the eternal word of God? These people, these genealogical tables that most folks think are so dull and uninteresting, these are people whom God honored enough to put their names there, and he put it there for a purpose. God knows every one of us by name. Even the very hairs of our head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls to the earth without your father. Not It doesn't say without your father's knowledge. It says without your father. He's in control of even the sparrows who fall to the earth. Yes, the genealogical lists are a record of real history and real people. These were people who had contact with the living God either for good or for bad. Some of the names we have found in the scriptures are names of very, very evil people. God put them there for a reason as well, as we will see. But we're going to be able to learn something from their successes and from their mistakes. Do you know the New Testament tells us that? It tells us very specifically, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The reason we see these things there is... They are examples for us. They are an admonition. They are a warning for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, Now these things also were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. There are some bad examples there that teach us what we must not do, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. This morning in our Sunday school lesson, Brother Sidwell spoke to us about Abraham and he talked about being children of the promise and we find that there are those who refuse to walk by faith and it tells us in Hebrews 4 verse 11, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The children of Israel were killed in the wilderness because they did not believe. They gave us an example. They gave us an example of unbelief. They they show to us what happens to those who will not believe. They are examples for us. James chapter 5 verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Following our Lord Jesus Christ does not mean you're going to have a life that is filled with ease. As the hymn writer has said, shall I be carried to the skies on flowering beds of ease while others bled to wound the, sail to uh, bloody seas? I can't remember the first part of that phrase. Um, shall we as Christians go through life without any problems? No, we will not. Shall we not suffer some things? Yes, we will. You see, the walk of faith is not simply the walk down a primrose path with nothing but delights along the way. There will be trouble. There will be sorrows. There will be grief. And so we can take the prophets as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And then another of the negative examples, Second Peter 2.6, And overturning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. There are warning examples in the Bible to those who have decided to reject God. There are warning examples to those who will not walk in his path. There are warning examples to those who will not follow the light that Jesus gives in his word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But no, they choose instead to walk ungodly. Sodom and Gomorrah are given in scripture as an example to all those who will after live ungodly. And of course that directly ties in with warnings of apostasy and immorality spoken of by Jude with Second Peter being a parallel epistle to that warning. The fourth thing that we learn about looking at this name Enoch in this genealogy is that God honored specific people or chose out of all the possible historic examples these specific people to be select, articulate, clear, specific warnings 
to us by putting their names in his eternal word. Number five, we can learn from this that God wants us to know their names because he considered them to be important in some way for our edification, instruction, blessing, or warning. Six, many of these names have important meanings in and of themselves. The names mean something and are a statement of the moral and spiritual character of the men listed. So if you go to the trouble to study the meaning of the names, you will soon begin to realize that God gave us those to tell us certain character qualities, certain moral qualities that either should be present or should not be present in our lives. For example, 1 Samuel 25, 25, it's Abigail coming to David after David and his men have been hiding out. They protected Nabal's shepherds uh, in the wilderness, uh, keeping them safe so that they weren't missing any sheep. And then they come in the spring and they ask for uh, some help from Nabal. And Nabal says, I'm not going to give you any help. And he sends David's messengers away. So David's about to go and take it by force. And Abigail hears of it. And she goes in to uh, find out if that's true. It is. So she takes a, a bunch of food out to David and his men who are marching on the war path down toward Nabal. And here's what she says. Here's an interesting illustration of the meaning of a name carried over in the character of the man. This is Abigail speaking. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name. And folly is with him. You see, Nabal means fool. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Names have meanings. Now, I know some of you think that the names we gave our kids are weird names. But all right, those names have meaning. The name of every one of the 13 children, first name put together with its middle name, says something about the character of God and about the person we want that child to become. My wife and I sat up many late nights looking at Hebrew and Greek lexicons and concordances and dictionaries and working on those names until God gave us peace that we had given the right name to each child. Names have significance. In the scripture they tell you something about the character of the person. God in his sovereignty saw to it that it be that way, and God chose certain names. Of the millions and billions of names that have been on the planet, he chose certain ones to put into his word. The names are not random. They are also very methodically set in the context of family lines. From the study of all the genealogical tables, and there are many of them in scripture, we discover that some lines were sovereignly elected for extended blessing, and some lines were sovereignly elected for permanent cursing and blotting out from under heaven. For example, Deuteronomy 25, 19. Therefore shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Here's a job you're going to do, don't ever forget it. Blot out the name of Amalek. The second thing that we learn as we see this comment here in the book of Genesis about Enoch is that God took him out at a re relatively young age. He was a young man when God took him home. In other words, he did not have to be relatively old to have a close walk with God. You may not be relatively old, but you can have a close walk with God. Let me explain what I mean. Adam lived 930 years and then he died. Seth lived 912 years, Enos lived 905 years, Kainan lived 910 years, Mahalaliel lived 895 years, Jared, who was Enoch's father, lived 962 years, and then there was Enoch, and then the Methuselah is Enoch's son. He lived 969 years before he died. So Enoch's father and Enoch's son are the two longest lived men recorded in the Bible, 962 years and 969 years. The average age for those first eight generations is 926 years plus one month. That's a pretty long average lifespan. Enoch came out of long living gene pool. God took him to heaven, however, 
at the age of 365. In other words, God shortened his earthly life expectancy by approximately 561 years, roughly two-thirds of the time that he might normally have expected to live. Now let me ask you a question. If you had that extra 561 years that Enoch got taken away from him, as we would look at it humanly speaking, if you had 561 years to live, what do you think you could do in that amount of time? 561 years. If you live to be 100, that's not even 20% of that time. What could you do if you were strong and healthy and could live another 561 years? Do you think you could do something for the glory of God? Do you think that you would be able to learn a lot more and be able to serve the Lord in a broader way than right now you have time and opportunity to do so? Let me put it this way. The high range average age for men today is somewhere between 85 and 95 years old, depending on which actuarial tables you look at. If you take away two-thirds of that lifespan, you have a lifespan, compared to Enoch's, of between 28 to 31 and a half years old. A man who dies at age 28, for example, is a relatively young man, just starting his productive life. Those of you who are adults, think back to that time when you were 28 years old. What had you accomplished for God by age 28? Let me ask another question. Had you reached your spiritual prime of maturity at age 28? How closely were you walking with God when you were that age? Were you such a choice vessel of God at that age that God really wanted you in the courts of heaven and took you home to be with himself? Well, no, I know that's not true because you're here. Me too. But Enoch was such a man. The third thing that we notice as we look at this list in which Enoch finds prominence is that only two people in the entire list in Genesis 5 have comments made about them, Enoch and Noah. It's rather significant, and I'll say this now because our time is flying by and I might not get to it at the end of the message. The ladies threatened me at breakfast time that I had to have you out of here in time for the luncheon that was following. And I said, well, I'll try to do that as long as you give me a steak. They, they wouldn't admit that they would do that, but I will try to get you out on time. So let me say this. Enoch and Noah are the two that are chosen in this list to have special commentary given about their lives. Enoch gives to us a picture of those who are taken out before judgment hits. Noah gives us a picture of those who are protected during the time of God's worldwide judgment. The church is going to be taken out before the great tribulation, just like Enoch was taken out before the flood. Noah, like Israel, who will be redeemed through the tribulation, God protecting them in some very special places and locations, and we don't have time to talk about that this morning, but prophesied in the Old Testament, Israel, at the end of the tribulation period, every Jew is going to be saved. Paul says so in Romans 11.25, and so shall all Israel be saved. There's coming a time when Israel will have to go through that time of judgment, but God will keep them safe and preserve them until the end. And it gives to us a picture, a symbolic type, though he was a real man. He gives us a picture of the church going out before the judgment hits. Noah gives us a picture of Israel making it safely through under the protecting hand of God through the tribulation period and moving into the millennium. There was a new earth that was given to Noah and his sons. Very interesting as we compare this man Enoch who walked with God as a picture of the church. You and I have so much more in terms of God's specific revelation than Enoch ever had. We have God's word complete and finished. And as Enoch walked with God, you and I also have something else 
that Enoch did not have, and that was the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit of God, so that we might walk with God. How much more are we accountable for walking with God than even Enoch was accountable for walking with God? God is telling us something through those lists by the specific people he makes comments about. The fourth thing that we notice is that this list here is selective. Only one son is mentioned from each of the fathers, the firstborn sons. But those sons were not only children. After each father, we see the phrase, so-and-so lived, after he begat so-and-so a certain number of years, quote, and begat sons and daughters. That was also true of Enoch. Did you notice that in the passage as we read it through? It says that after he bat Methuselah, he lived 300 years and begat sons and daughters. We tend to think of Enoch as this unique, lone, individual figure out there. We never think of his wife. We never think of his kids other than Methuselah because he's the guy that lived the longest of anybody. But it says he begat sons and daughters. Enoch had other Children, children who watched their father walk by faith. Children who watched their father walk with God. Children who heard their father preach. We know he preached. We know he was a prophet. It says so in the book of Jude. They heard it, but apparently it didn't make any impact on them. That's a serious thought. God hasn't chosen to tell us about the other sons and daughters, but all of those other descendants from Adam and his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on, all of them were busy fulfilling the dominion mandate of Genesis 128 in an ungodly way. The, the mandate is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over all of the visible creation. We don't have dominion over the invisible creation, but we have dominion over the visible creation. How many children do you think you could have in 900 years? Stop and think about it. How many children could those children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren have in that span of 900 years? How big of a spiritual impact do you think you would have had opportunity to make if you lived 900 years and saw all of these generations of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, what kind of a spiritual heritage could you pass on to them? You see, each of them is individually accountable before God. Enoch had many children, sons and daughters. They perished in the flood. Young people, you are personally and individually accountable to God. You can't ride to heaven on the coattails of your parents. You can't ride to heaven by having a perfect Sunday school attendance, or perfect church attendance, or going on all the youth retreats. You are personally accountable to the living God. Here is a man who walked with God and had many children, and we don't see any of them other than Noah down to generations, walking with God, having fellowship with God, living for God. It was Noah and his family that were saved alive in the ark. Do you have the right relationship with God? Are you walking with God? Notice two other things about Enoch. Did you notice in the text he didn't start fathering children until he was 65 years old? He was apparently in no rush to get married. Young people, there I perceive in many cases, and I've talked to lots of young people, there is this intense pressure, desire to rush ahead, to get married. 
But you see, Enoch's focus was not on temporal things. His focus was not on pleasure. His focus was not on being independent from his parents. His focus was not on having fun and doing his own thing. His focus was not on making money. His focus was not on, let's let the good times roll. As a child and as a young man, he was busy focusing on his walk with God. The verse tells us something else. After Enoch started fathering children, his family didn't suddenly become a priority that usurped his personal walk with God. Now family is a very high priority as far as God is concerned. And many people use their divinely ordained family responsibilities, but they use them as an excuse for cutting back on their personal time with God. If anything, having a family demands that you spend more time, not less time, with God and with his word. Spending more time seeking wisdom as to how to handle the ever-changing stages of life that your children will go through. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. He didn't cut back on his walk with God just because he suddenly had more family responsibilities. How often I have heard people use family time as their way of getting out of their responsibilities with God. Many years ago I pastored a church up in North Jersey. There was a family up there. They actually got saved almost simultaneously, father, mother, and all four of the children. Children were teenagers at that time, and um, they came to church for a while, and then they started missing. They began to miss more and more and more regularly. And so I went and talked to the dad, and I said, you know, what, uh, what gives here? What's going on? He said, well, you know, uh, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to make our family a priority. I said, that's true. And he says, and uh, it's supposed to be a very high priority. I said, that's true. And he said, and so we want to make sure that we have plenty of family time together. And uh, so since uh, I work during the week, and we sort of have to use Saturday as a, a day to relax, we do family things on Sunday. They happen to be into motorcycles, and the entire family would go out to motorcycle races on Sunday. He was using his family and his divinely ordained responsibilities as a father to spend time with his family to miss church, to miss his personal devotion times. He was too busy. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. That's a pretty long, consistent lifestyle lifespan. That's the first thing we notice. The fifth thing that we notice from looking at this genealogy is that none of Enoch's sons and daughters walked as closely with God as Enoch did. God didn't take them home in the same way he took Enoch. They had plenty of time to see him. They had plenty of time to follow his example. They had plenty of time to digest what he had preached. You know, it's uh, rather interesting because Adam was still alive when Enoch and Methuselah were born. Most people don't realize that, but if you look at the overlap in the genealogical tables, both Adam and Methuselah were alive at the same time, and Enoch was the father of Methuselah. That means he was alive when Adam was still alive. Maybe Enoch heard Adam talk about walking with God in the garden. Maybe Enoch had heard Adam talk about the horrible pain when he sinned and when he lost fellowship, but Enoch determined in his heart, I want to walk with God. I see what blessing it was to Adam, and I see what blessing he lost when he didn't walk with God. Whatever the case, it's clear that Enoch earnestly desired, earnestly desired to walk with God. You know, folks, think about this for a second. We always talk about support systems and, you know, we talk about, you know, group mechanics and all the things that are so popular today and how you can't really do it on your own and do it all alone and you really can't stand by yourself. You've got to have these people and these people and these people who are all supporting you from different directions, you know. Enoch was alone. What we need to do is teach our sons and daughters to stand alone in their relationship with God, regardless of what the cost. 
If you're walking with Jesus, you need nobody else. You don't need their approval. You don't need their applause. You don't need their commendation. You don't need their money. You don't need anything but Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Enoch was alone. He had to have an earnest internal desire to walk with God. It had to be compelling. He had to be desperately wanting that walk, spiritually motivated in his thirst for God because he didn't have any other support system of like-minded believers to encourage him. We see that by the time we get to the days of Noah. The entire earth is filled with violence and wickedness and corruption. Adults, we need to learn to walk alone with God regardless of the cost. Our children will never see what it's like unless they see it in us. You know, Methuselah died at age 969. He actually died the year that the great flood of Noah came. Perhaps Methuselah, the son of Enoch, died in the flood. Remember, God sent the flood as a judgment on the world for its wickedness and violence. That should be a lesson to us, because we're in a world that is filled with wickedness and violence. We are living in a day as the days of Noah, our Lord referred to that. We have to have a personal relationship of walking with God ourselves. The sixth thing, then we must move quickly here. only have six more minutes, so we're down to point six out of 372. The sixth thing we notice is that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was the first person in the Bible that tells us to walk with God since the days before the fall when Adam walked with God in the cool garden of Eden. That implies that even among the chosen line, there are few that have a close, intimate, personal fellowship with God, even though God designed man to be in that relationship with him. We go down to the seventh generation before we find it mentioned again. Our Lord said, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes? I think all of us notice, and I was having a discussion with one of the other pastors during this conference, of the apostasy that seems to have crept into the church, of the carelessness, lackadaisical attitude, the, the, the fact that the people seem to think that the scriptures are not as important as the rock music in the church. People, we went from Adam who walked in the garden with God to Enoch who walked with God. And nobody in between is mentioned as having walked with God. We know some did. Abel did. He was a man of faith. He was killed because of it. But as you look at the heroes of faith, we find a great paucity of men listed as men who were close in their fellowship with God. They are great heroes of faith. Don't get me wrong on that. But how few, how few they are. The seventh thing that we learn about Enoch is that walking closely with God means that you will understand and you will have insight into the plan of God and will be bold and unashamed in your witness to lost sinners. We learn this from the New Testament in the book of Jude. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, that is, these apostates, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak of great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That is, they'll flatter you to take advantage of you. You know, as we look at that description of Enoch here, we learn an incredible amount about walking with God from that very brief description. One, we learn that walking with God gives insight into future events. Enoch prophesied of these. Number two, we learn that walking with God gives us an earnest expectation of the Lord's return. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. We learn that walking with God gives us a zeal for holiness and for holy living. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Did you catch all those times that he talks about the ungodly, the ungodly, the ungodly, the ungodly, the ungodly did this, the ungodly did that? That's what Enoch was preaching. He had a zeal for holiness. He had a zeal for holy living. 
That characterized our Lord as well. John 2.17 And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up as he drove the money changers out of the temple. We learned that walking with God gives us a hatred for sin. If you think you're walking with God, do these things characterize your life? Do the things of the future, do you have an understanding of them? Do you have an expectancy of them? Do you have a zeal for holiness? Do you have a zeal for holy living? Do you have a hatred for sin? We learned that walking with God out of Enoch's life produces a lifestyle that is stark contrast to the lifestyle of the ungodly. And you know, when we talk about that stark contrast, that means not making excuses for our faith, not making excuses for our manner of life, or our clothing, or our music, or our friends, or our activities. There is a genuine contrast with the world, not a sanitized, Christianized, wimpy version of the world. We learn from Enoch that walking with God produces godly speech. Godly language, godly choice of words that is in contrast to the ungodly speech of the world. It says, all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That was part of his message. Clean up your language. We learned that walking with God produces a boldness to confront the ungodly and to speak out plainly against their ungodliness with one of two results. And you always see this, one of two results. When you proclaim the word of God boldly, carefully, accurately, articulately, in the language that people can understand, it will result in one of two things. It will result either in bringing them to repentance or it will make their reprobation and condemnation patently clear as a warning for others not to follow them. John Wesley always knew when his sermons were taking effect because either the people repented in sackcloth and ashes or they tried to stone him and run him out of town. Walking with God, we learn that that produces an attitude of gratefulness, not the attitude of murmuring and complaining. He tells us there in that passage that Enoch was preaching and these were people that were murmuring and complainers, walking after their own lusts, their mouths speak of great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. But instead, we have an attitude of gratefulness, not an attitude of murmuring and complaining. You know, God killed the children of Israel in the wilderness because they were ungrateful, they were belly aching, and for ten times he put up with it, but finally he destroyed them. Numbers chapter 14 tells us that because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither any of them that provoked me see it. Paul tells us, he reminds us about that time, and he warns us against the murmuring and complaining, and that's the, the sign of apostates. That's the sign of those who've turned their backs on God. That's the sign of those who are not grateful to God. Enoch was a man grateful to God, and he pointed out the sin of those who were not and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Something else to notice here, and our time really is up now. The statement in Jude 14 also makes it clear that there are not long gaps in Genesis genealogy, or missing generations. Enoch is listed as the seventh from Adam in Genesis, and Enoch, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is listed that way in the book of Jude as well. Enoch's only mentioned 11 times in four books of the Bible. Eight times in Genesis. He's mentioned in the genealogy of Christ recorded in Luke. That's the genealogy of Mary, which is designed to prove the real humanity of our Lord traced all the way back to Adam. Enoch is important. He's seventh in the genealogical list of our Lord Jesus Christ which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malaliel, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. He's mentioned in the list of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, a passage which also helps us to further understand what it means to walk with God. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What does that mean to, walking, to be walking with God? It means walking by faith. Brother Sidwell talked about that this morning. 
Walking with God means to walk by faith. It means to be walking in a way that pleased God. That's what Enoch did. Number three, it means to have a good testimony. That is an external witness born about you. What others know and say about you, that you are pleasing God. That is, they can see the difference between you and the rest of the world. And fourth, walking with God means that you will be diligently seeking God. That's what Enoch did according to verse 6 here. Earnestly desiring above all else to find God and to cling to Him. Never leave His side. Always to be in fellowship with Him. Always to reject every sin and everything that would displease Him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's in the description of Enoch. Walking with God. Amos 3.3 tells us, Can two walk together, except they be agreed? Now who has to agree with whom? Does God have to agree with you? Or do you have to agree with God if you want to walk with him? I think it's patently clear. You have to agree with God. You have to agree with what his word says. You have to agree with what his word requires. You have to agree with the fact that there is only one way of salvation. The one way is Jesus. You have to agree that to live the Christian life, there is only one way to do it, and that is according to the scriptures. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, we didn't have time for that passage in Psalm 16, but thou wilt show me the path of life. God has done that. He's given us his word. In thy presence is fullness of joy. That's where the path leads. We've talked about that. The path of life leads to heaven. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Young people, you think, oh, the pleasures of this world are so titillating, so exciting, so wonderful to partake of, but they are the road to death. The place where there are pleasures forevermore is at the right hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in the path. Remember the old paths. Walk in the light. Walk in the way. Walk by faith. Walk pleasing to God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us all to learn to walk with God. It's not easy. There is much that pulls us to the side. There's the world. And oh, it looks so exciting. There's the flesh that fifth column quizzling movement that's inside of us that's always trying to open the door for the enemy, always trying to get us off the path. There's the devil who has studied us carefully, who's brilliant, who understands what we're like. He's dealt with many generations of people. He knows the things that work. He knows the things that work on people of our disposition. And so those are the things that he tempts us with. Oh, Father, we have many enemies, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have given us the indwelling Holy Spirit. You have given us your instruction manual, the Word of God. You have given us a clear articulation of what happens to those who refuse to walk in the way. You have given to us a beautiful picture of those as examples for us who have walked in the way and are now listed as heroes of faith. And the list is not complete as we find in the last verse of that chapter, that they without us should not be made perfect. You will add our names to that list as we walk by faith, as we walk with God. Father, take your word, let it not return void, but let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.